to receive your word. Lord, help me to open my heart, my mind to hear you. Give me ears that will listen and a heart that will receive. Thank you for your word, the Bible. I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. Now we will go straight into what we were. We left on at uh, last Sunday. Uh, unfortunately, in the second service, I never went as far as I did in the first service. That, that is last Sunday. Uh, I finished on point number three that we were looking at last Sunday in the first service. The second service, I was a bit caught up. Uh, and I couldn't be able to do that. So what I'm going to do, I will not talk much about point number three because I intend this morning to complete this series. We've gone, gotten into a new month, the month of Thanksgiving, and I have no intention to continue beyond this Sunday. Secondly, today we have set aside this day to pray and to bless our Compassion Ministry. So at the end of the service, I'll be inviting members of the Compassion Ministry who are, uh, who are here together with us. They will come here and we will pray for them, bless them, dedicate them, and believe God for them to pick up the mantle of this ministry as they lead us into the year 2019, 2020, to do this ministry as the Lord has spoken to us. Are you happy with that? Yeah, because God doesn't give us a message and leaves it hanging. God always ministers with a purpose. And as I have been saying again and again, this is not a word for the weak and the mean. This message is one of those that will only be received by the strong. The strong because... The, the theology be behind this message is so deep, it's so tough to apply, it is so difficult for many people to do, like we shall see towards the end, but blessed are those that are willing to put aside their comforts, and those who are willing to sacrifice a little of what they have, to be able to enjoy the eternity and the treasures that this ministry bring, brings into their lives. So I beg you listen to me, I beg you give me a hearing ear. And I also beg you open your heart to allow God to deal with you and speak to you in those areas that he may need you to know. The scripture clearly tells us, when you know the truth, the truth does what? It sets you free. That is my prayer for you. So quickly, we were at the point where we were looking at uh, the commandments of God. And I ended where we were introducing Paul, if you can remember, Paul into the epistle of Paul, into the commandments which God had given the children, the, his people to do concerning the poor and the needy. I will do what I did in the first service. We read scripture a lot than what I than speaking. And uh, when I look at your faces, you are the most educated people in Kenya. Yeah, you look very nice, all of you. Look at your friend's face. Tell him you are good. And because of that, since you are very educated, I have no reason to believe that uh, I need to explain a lot on a scripture. Can I believe that? That you have the capacity to understand without explaining. Eh? Come on. Because you already have the theology, isn't it? So I will do more of scripture reading than scripture explaining. Now, Apostle Paul, at the introduction of, being, of, of his apostleship, when he was being ushered into the ministry of an apostle, and we find this in the, book of first, in the book of Galatians, if you could go there quickly. Galatians chapter 6, I mean chapter 2, verse 9 and verse 10. The Apostle Paul, at his inauguration... At his commissioning, let me use words that you are familiar with, at his consecration, when they were making him the apostle to the Gentiles, when he was taking the ministry of the needy, not the ministry to the Gentiles, to the people who we are here today, there were two commandments that he was given. Number one, to preach the gospel. And the most important of that commandment was the apostles, that is Apostle, apostle Peter, Apostle John, and Apostle... There were three apostles, key apostles. James, this, this, those were the, the, the big bishops of the church that time. When they were putting hands upon Paul and commissioning him and giving him the gown of being a bishop or being the minister of the gospel to the Gentiles, they requested him to do only two things. And I want us to read those two things in Galatians 2, 9 to 10. Quickly, as good students of the Bible. Please help me. Can you read with me? That's where we ended. It says, and when James gave us and John, who seemed to be what? Pillars. It means who were actually the, bis the, the, the bishops of the church. The pillars perceived the grace that was upon Paul. That was upon Paul. The grace that had been given to me. Paul is writing. This is Paul giving his testimony. He says, they gave me and Barnabas what? 
the right hand of fellowship. That is the first thing they were given. They were given the mandate to go out and do exactly what the early church was doing to the Jews people, the church in Jerusalem. That's the meaning of right hand of fellowship. They gave us or they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to who? And who are the Gentiles? Can you look at your friend telling me we are the Gentiles? That's why we are seated here this morning. If Paul never preached this gospel, we would not be sitting here this morning. So he was given the mandate to come to us with a message. Now, if you keep reading that scripture, it says to go to the Gentiles and they, and they to the, circum the circumcised. They here means Paul, Peter, John, and James. Those who remained, the key apostles, the 12 apostles, their mandate was not the Gentiles. It was to the, the Jews. The word circumcised means who? The Jews, the Jews there. Now, go to verse 10. Then verse 10 tells you what actually they told Paul to do. And I want you to think of Paul standing here and is preaching the same message which I'm preaching to you here this morning. Okay? They said they desired. Can somebody say desired? desired. Who are these people desiring? James? Peter? John. Very good students. I think my, this church is the best church in the world. You know there are people when you preach they don't know what you're talking about. But here we believe in the Bible. We are so blessed. Eh? You people, you know what I'm talking about. Eh? They desired only that we should... Uh -uh, can you read with me? Do what? Remember the poor... No, leave that alone. So what was the desire of those men that were commissioning Paul? I mean commissioning Paul. Now if Paul was standing here today, what do, what do you think Paul would preach? What would he tell you to do? Remember the poor. Now, Paul, because he was a man who was anointed and a man who was operating under very special grace, the scripture says, Paul explains himself there. He says, although they told me to do this thing, he says, the very thing which I, I use, is who there? Paul also was eager to do. Now, that tells you Paul understood the ministry of the needy and the poor. Do we put an attic there? Okay, let, let me move on. Now, so Paul understood that ministry. And Paul had a theology. Can somebody say theology? He developed a theology. Theology means a system that operates to answer to something. A theology of this ministry. A theology of this ministry. Which Paul preached in every church where he was the pastor. If he was in GCI, Paul would not pass without preaching this, ministry, this message to you. And that theology, which I'm talking about here, the theology of equity, the theology of ministering to the needy and the poor, is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12 to verse 15. We're reading scriptures. Chapter 8, verse 12 to verse 15. Are you still with me? Can we look at what Paul developed thereafter? He says here, for if there is, this is another theology, there is a what? A willing mind it is acceptable according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. That is the principle be behind giving. He was telling the people, the first thing which God demands of us is a willing mind. Now this ministry won't make any, any meaning to you if you don't have a willing mind. It means you must, be, you must be willing to understand what we are talking about and be willing to do what we are discussing here. So he begins by talking about a willing mind. Then he says, and it also depends on what you have, what you don't have. Not what you don't have. God doesn't go with the amounts. He goes with what you have in your hands. Can we move, boom, we move to verse 13? I mean verse 14. I mean, is it verse 13 or verse 14? 13. He says, for I do not mean that others should be eased. And you, burdened. You know when we talk about giving... In the mind of many people, they think, ah, why should I give to him? I have worked very hard. This fellow doesn't work. They don't want to go and work. Why should I give to him? Eh? I, have, I have put in my, all my efforts. If it was not because of my hard work, the energies I have put in this, if it was not because of the education I paid for. But listen, the Bible says it's not because we don't give because we want others to be eased and for us to be but then, this is the theology. He says, but, can somebody help me there? What? An equality. An equality. That now, at the time of your what? Abundance, you may supply their lack. That at their 
abundance also may supply your lack. That there may be an equality. This is what I call as the principle or the theology of equity, which Paul developed. And this he was speaking to the church of Corinthians. Because there were brethren in another church somewhere who were going through a very difficult time. There were many poor people in the church in Jerusalem, which was the headquarters of the ministry. Where people were going starving, there was a famine. So Paul is visiting this one church called Corinthian church that was one of the richest, most endowed church within the churches which he had. So he told these people, I'm not teaching you this doctrine to burden you so that they can be eased, but I'm preaching this and teaching you so that there can be an equality. Then Paul explains, he says this, God never gives to you to lavish it upon yourself. And I'll mention that at the end of my sermon. He gives to you so that you can be able to give to another who lacks. So that tomorrow when you are also in lack, that one who now has will do what? Give to you. That's the law of equity. But you know many of us when God blesses us, and when we have things, we feel like God is answering to our need. And we, we, we even want more and more of it than finding out how we can use what God has given to us to bless other people. Now, he establishes that by using a scripture, using a, a, a word that was written. And he puts it this way, as it is written. Can somebody help me here? He who gathered much has, has what? Nothing left over. And he who gathered little has no luck. That is the principle that was used in the early church. For as many as had brought, and as many as, as had need were given. The principle, the same principle that is being applied by Moses in the early church, in the early church in the wilderness. That those who do not have can be able to benefit from those who have. Because tomorrow, you who, da, who, who has, you may not have it tomorrow. And I can see, say this without any apology. I can tell you, I'm not prophesying doom. Listen to me. Don't ever think what you have, you'll have it forever. You may not have it forever. In fact, I have learned by experience, by looking at other people. Those who had, when we were being born, are the ones who are now begging. Am I saying the truth? You go back to your village and look at those men who had things in their village. The ones who had many cows, the ones who had many lands, they are the ones now who had, who had shops. Like when I go to Mahanga village, all those shops are closed, they are locked up, and there are other fellows who are operating those shops. So every time you think you have and you will continue to have is a lie. And you may say, Pastor Mlema, no, me, I've, I just have about 10 years to go and I have enough that can keep me. But let me tell you, how about your children? So Paul was establishing a fact there. When you gather, you gather so that you have no left over. Are you listening to me? And he who has little, he may not have any luck. That is the principle of ministry to the needy and the poor. Then he finishes in verse 16. Is it verse 16? Where he puts it this way in verse 16. Is it verse, Okay, I can just end there. Let me end that one there. So Paul, this is a principle which he taught in the churches where he was ministering to. Then he gave a command. Paul gave a command. And this is the order he gave. Chapter 16 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, or 1, 2 Cor 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1. And I want you to read that with me. Sorry for going too fast. I need to finish what I'm talking about here. He says in chapter 16, verse 1. Do you have your Bible? How many have the Bible? Can I lift your hand if you have your Bible? Whether in the book or in the iPad or in the... Okay. So I want you to agree with me. He says, and now concerning the collections for the saints. This word collections for the saints didn't mean the normal offering. It was meant to support the needy among the saints. He says concerning the collection for the saints, I have, can you help me here? What has he done? He has given orders. He says, I have given orders to the churches of Galatia. There's a brother who on, on our on our Digital, digital, digital announcements. Did you see the brother, the last one? The week that was. He mentioned, he says, we, I give you an order. Can I give an order? 
He says, Gio, give an order to GCI. Paul gave an order. I won't give an order, but maybe I'll give an order towards the end of the service. But Paul, Paul gave an order there. He said to the, the collections for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, he says, so, help me here. So you must do also. Can you turn to your brother, tell him now, we are, we are getting an order. Don't harass him. Talk to him nicely. Mwambia, see Pastor Mulema. Paul anapeana order because he's the chief apostle of the Gentiles. Isn't it? So the order is that even us in, in GCI Central, we must also make collections for the saints. I want to finish on this point. Paul had a practice in his churches. All the churches that Paul was the pastor it was a practice of those churches to support the needy and the poor. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 to verse 12, and I'm done on this, on this one. I move to point number 4, and we finish this thing. This is what he says, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse, verse 8. If you are there, shout a big amen. amen. All right. It says this, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you, having all sufficiency in all things, you may have an abundance for every good work. Can I interpret that scripture? What this scripture says, God is able to make you have the grace. Make you have the grace that every time he makes you sufficient, he gives you enough money. In all things, you may have abundance to use that money for every good work. He never gives us money to go to carnival. And sit, how many have been to Carnival? I know a number of you know what I'm talking about. And you sit on that table and you eat as much meat as you can. You know, they put a, they put a flag there. I've been there. So don't feel guilty if you, if you, you go. Hey, Pastor, Bishop has been there. They, they give you a flag. You put a flag on your table. And you eat as much meat as you, you can. When you are tired of eating meat, you, you drop the flag. Then the meat won't come anymore. How many of you love meat? So if you, if you want to eat meat in abundance, having all sufficiency of meat, you go to where? Carnival. That's not the reason for God blessing you. The Bible tells me that you may have an abundance for every good work. Let's go to verse 9. Verse 9. Verse 9, it says this. As it is written. What is written there? He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor and his righteousness endure us forever. This is not a word, this is not meant for God. That's a scripture for your abundance. That when God gives you the, abad the abundance, you need to disperse that abroad and you give to the poor and then your righteousness will endure forever. That's the secret behind this ministry. Verse 10. Verse 10. Now, he who supplies seed, please read with me, who supplies seed to the sower, that is now God, and bread for your food, supply and multiply seed you have sown and increase fruits of your righteousness. This means this. When you disperse abroad, when you give to the poor, God is able to supply seed to you because you are sowing. And number two, he'll give you bread for your food. You will never lack when you give to the poor. Because my data is God. When I'm in, in need, I tell God, hey, then young. Are you seeing it? You will never lack. He will also multiply the seed which you have sown. It is only in the poor that your seed multiplies. Not in the bishop. 310. It never multiplies there. It says he will multiply the seed sown and he will increase your fruits of righteousness. It's a righteous thing when you give to the poor. Verse 11. Verse 11. He says, while you are enriched in everything... In all liberality, liberality means in all giving willingly. When you are giving and you are supplying and you are, you are giving as the Lord blesses you. He says, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. When we give, we cause thanksgiving through us to God. Then Paul, towards the end of this scripture in verse 12, he explained how he, ha it, uh, he, has, he has known how this ministry works. And he says for the administration, the word administration here means for the practice of this. 
the putting at work of this ministry, the administration of this service, which service is he talking about here? The service of giving to the poor. The administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but is also abounding through many thanksgiving to God. Yeah? I explained last Sunday, my wife was not here. And I said when I was quoting her, she knows, we used to write letters. It would take one month for me to hear Nelly. Because when I write, it takes, half, it takes uh, 15 days to reach Indi India. Then another 15 days, she replies. I think we only wrote to each other four times in a year. Can you imagine? <laughs> but Nelly, if you can remember my letters, did you keep any? <laughs> I was so spiritual that time. I want to say this while she's listening so that she can confirm. We never used to say, hi, darling, like some of you are doing even before you marry. <laughs> or sweetheart, hi. I would begin by saying, looking for a scripture that almost says the same thing, <laughs> but it's very spiritual. So that if somebody lands on that letter, he will know I'm a spiritual person. And I would begin with 1 John, no, 3 John, verse, verse 1. Beloved. <laughs> and I would say, I wish above all things that Nelly, you may prosper and be in good health. I think when she read that one, the heart just began palpitating. <laughs> and if you remember, I used to finish by encouraging you because I don't know whether there's a draft or not. I would say, and my God shall supply. <laughs> yeah. Then I would wait to hear what she will tell me in return. I didn't realize that that scripture wasn't based on just loving somebody and trying to wish that person well. If you got the book of Corinthians, the book of Philippians, that scripture was Paul writing to the church of Corinth, expressing what they had done for him. And Paul said to them, he says, Corinthians, I mean, uh, the Philippians, when I came to Macedonia, there is no church that ministered to my needs in the ministry of giving and receiving, except you. He said, even now when I'm here, you send to me when I had nothing. And you didn't send once, you send once again and again. Then he mentioned, he says, and even now, a prophetess is here with you, with me, bringing the gift which you've given to me because of my luck. Then he says, and because of that, my God, Amen. you didn't hear me, shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Amen. That was the qualification of that scripture. It was not meant for you when you are writing to your girlfriend. You make her feel very nice. It was not meant for that. Now that is what Paul is telling us. He's telling the administration of this service. When you do that ministry to the needy, it does not only supply your needs, the needs of the saints, but before God, the Bible says it carries with it many thanksgiving to God. Are you with me? Now I want to close the chapter there. There are many other scriptures. I'll close it there. To simply tell you, the New Testament church, the Gentile church, practiced the ministry of giving to the needy and the poor. Can you put a tick to that? Can I move on now? Number four. Point number four. And this point comes in as the blessings on those who serve the poor. These ones are straightforward. So I'll just read and I, we, we read. We keep on reading and going. The blessings that follow those who serve the poor. Number one. God will always bless the land that you till. The land that you till. Like I've kept on saying here, since I got that revelation, I've been speaking to the church every time I've been telling you, God does not bless, just bless. He blesses the land that you till. Meaning every morning you wake up to go to work, God will bless always the place where you're working. And he'll also bless the labor of your hands. That is what God promised man from the beginning. But it is also tied not just to loving God, it is tied to you giving to the needy and the poor. So in the morning when you're going to work, tell God, give me an opportunity to give to somebody who has nothing. And when you desire that way, he begins blessing your labor, the labor of your hands. And multiplying the seed that is going to put into your hands. So that you can be able to share it with another who does not have. How do I know that? In the book of uh, Deuteronomy 15 and verse 10. Quickly, we are reading. Moving to point number two. Deuteronomy 15, 10. Can you read with me? It says, you shall surely give to him. The word him here means who? Poor. Because the other 
Verse 9 was talking about the poor. Don't be too hard. Hold your fist against the poor. So you shall give to him and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him, to the poor. Because, somebody help me, because what? Can you read with me? Because of what? For this thing, the Lord your God will bless you in all your works and in all which you put your hand to do. How many want blessings? Or do you want me to lay hands on you to get the blessings? Because that's what we think. Oh, Pastor, speak a word in my life. Nena, nena, nena. Even if I speak, nothing. The only thing you need to do now, go and give. And then the Lord will bless the labor of your hands. Number two, second thing. The second one is that God provides you with welfare and longevity. Welfare and longevity. Welfare and longevity. What do I mean by this? Welfare means you will live well. In other words, you'll have tea on your table, bread on your table, you'll have clothes to put on, you'll have a decent house to stay in. That is welfare. Longevity, you will live long. We have men today who are living long, but without welfare. No food, no nothing. And we have others who have everything, but they are living only 15, 20 years and they are done. But the promise of God is this. He'll not only give you to live well, but he'll also give you to live long. This is the only promise in the Bible which is attached to the Ten Commandments. And if you can read the Ten Commandments, the first five, four, sorry, the first four, they touch on your relationship with God. The first four commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart. No images, no this, no, the first four. Okay? I'm a jealous God. The last five, they touch on you and your neighbor. Don't steal, don't kill, don't murder, don't do this. Don't have an, a bad eye against your neighbor. The, the last five. But the middle one, that is commandment five. It touches on your relationship with your parents. And that commandment has a promise in it. It says, thou shalt honor your father and your mother that you may live long. That's how Moses put it. The Apostle Paul qualifies it by saying, this is the only commandment that has a promise. In the book of Ephesians. Now let me tell you something. It is this commandment which is attached to giving to the poor. Because when you give to the poor, the Lord does not only bless what you are earning, wh where you are working, but he also gives you welfare and he gives you longevity. Can we read in the Bible? Right, let's read these scriptures. Number one, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 5 to 7. Quickly, 5 to 7. I think I'm doing good. Can we go together? For if... You do what? Uh -uh. The word is what? Thoroughly. Uh, don't, don't, don't jump words quickly. Thoroughly. <laughs> if we thoroughly do what? Amend your ways and your doings. It means some of us, we think we are on the right track, but, track, but we are not on the right track. If you will thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you will thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, let's go to verse 6. Yeah? If you will, if you will, if you do not oppress the what? Help me here. The stranger and who? And who? The widow. And do not shed innocent blood in this place or walk after other gods to your heart. Verse 7 qualifies it. And I want you to read with me verse 7. It says what? Verse 7. Then I will cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Longevity. Longevity. When you serve the needy, and when I use the word needy, I'm talking about the orphan, I'm talking about the widow, I'm talking about the fatherless, I'm talking about the stranger, and I'm talking about any weak person in society. The, the promise of God is, I will cause you to live in this land which I'm giving to you. The land may not be the land of Canaan. The land is the blessings God is giving to you. The place where you work, the home that he has given you. The place where you derive your supplies and you derive your provisions. He says, I will cause you to live in that place forever and ever. Another scripture. I hope you are enjoying my scriptures. Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse 16. And this is very, very important for you to note. Because I'll explain a little bit on this and move on to point number three in this category. He says in Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse 16. And please read with me. He says, he judged the cause of the poor and the needy. Then help me. Then what happened? Then it was 
Well, was not this knowing me, says the Lord. This is a question which the prophet Jeremiah was posing to the second last king of Israel, or king of Judah. The, the, the king who finally surrendered Judah to Babylon. Remember the first king was Saul. This is the 21st king of Israel. And the prophet Jeremiah is prophesying in his life. And he's telling him the reason why you are getting into this trouble is because you, did, you forsook me, you didn't know me. I say in the first service, when you're reading the book of Jeremiah, don't read it in isolation with the book of Chronicles. Jeremiah was a prophet, the last prophet to the kings of Israel. The kings, I'm talking about the kings before they went to Babylon. Are you he hearing me? So Jeremiah was like a prophet who was prophesying things that will happen to Israel in captivity. And he was speaking these words to the second last king of Israel. Reminding him of his father. He had a father called Josiah. Who was one of the greatest leaders that ever lived. In fact, apart from, from David, we believe Josiah was one of the key leaders that lived a godly life. Began reigning when he was a young man and reigned close to over 40, almost to 40 years. And Josiah, because he loved people, he loved the poor. Jeremiah reminded his son and he told him, he judged and the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well with him. It means he lived to reign because he judged the cause of the poor and the needy. Are you listening to me? Then he says, is this not knowing me? But this fellow had refused to judge the cause of the living, I mean the cause of the needy and the needy and the needy and the poor. He becomes king like this and the man thinks, now that I am king, I am now in control. Began molesting the poor, molesting the needy. His heart turned away from God. So just here, the man began now, he's even saying, yet your eyes and your heart are for nothing but for covetousness, for shedding innocent blood, and for practicing of oppression and violence. I didn't want to read this. I'm just giving it to you because I want you to be a student of the Bible. Are you getting my point? So he reminded him, was it not your father who took care of the needy and it was well? How many wanted to be well with them in their lives? It can only be well with you when you serve the needy. And for you to understand how this young man ended, you can only understand that when you go with me quickly in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 1 and verse 2. And this Chronicles 36 was the end of the kings of Israel. After that, Nebuchadnezzar captured them and they were in Babylon for 70 years. Now look at what happened to this young king after his father died, Josiah. It says, then the people of the land took the man, his name was called who? Johannes, the son of, please help me, the son of who? Josiah. And made him king in his father's place in Jerusalem. When you get that promotion, how do you behave? Huh? When you get that position of leadership, how do you behave? Some fellows knew a katwe to a kula. So we are having a conversation from last week in this country. I don't know which side you belong, you belong to, but it's okay. Don't tell us. But there are people who are waiting. It's now a chance to eat. To molest the others. To kill those who never gave us opportunities. This man, he became king after his father's death. But look at verse 2. I mean verse, verse 2. Just this, his name was called who? It can't come from my mouth. So that name that you're mentioning, okay? Was how old? 23 years old when he became what? And how long did he reign? He reigned three months. How can you be a king for only three months? You've just begun eating. Eating what? The cake at State House. Three months and you are kicked out. Go to verse 3 and see. Three months. And the king of Egypt disposed him at Jerusalem. And he imposed on the land a tribute of 100 talents of silver. And the talents of gold. Verse 4. Verse 4 please. Okay, for your understand, for their understanding. Then the king of Egypt made his brother Eliakim king over Judah and Jerusalem, and he changed his name to that name. And then Necho took this fellow, his brother, and carried him where? To Egypt. And that was the beginning of exile. From Egypt, Nebuchadnezzar came and captured the whole of Jerusalem, everything. And he took them into captivity for a period of 70 years. 
Now, if you don't get that understanding, you will think God was just angry with Israel. No. The reason was simple. This man neglected the needy and the poor. Are you with me? Are you with me? Okay. If you're with me, I give God the praise for that. So I'm done with point number two. Point number two, when you serve the needy and the poor, God gives you welfare and don't give it. Number three, God credits you with heaven's treasure. And I won't dwell much on this, heaven's treasure. The word treasure here is only applied to things which are in heaven. Let me correct something here. But the Bible doesn't endorse any treasure on earth. And you will never find it. God will make you rich, he'll prosper you. But treasure, the word treasure, which in my translation here simply means something considered exceptionally precious. It simply means a great amount of accumulated money or precious possessions. It simply means something a supply stored up or hidden for future use. Nobody exposes treasure. If you have treasure, you hide it. Because it is very precious. And I'll tell you something, it is not on earth. I, I took interest to find out. Every word in the Bible that talks about treasure, what does it always refer to? And I realized treasure is always pegged to giving to the needy and the poor because it translates into an account that is hidden in heaven. Let me pause. I was told yesterday when you preach, you pause so that it can enter. Some of us, we just preach like machine guns. It gets into the ear and it gets through the other ear. So treasure is normally connected to giving. And this treasure is hidden in heaven. A place where no moth, no rust can come to. In this world, wherever you put your money, something will eat it. People think it's the, the rust that we know, not that rust. The economy collapses. And all your money, inflation comes and takes it up. You can even have a lot of business. Something just strikes and the, the whole thing goes down. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. But let me tell you, whatever you invest in heaven, there is no moth and there is no inflation in heaven. And that's the beauty of putting your money in heaven. Let me move on. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17. This one, I have said it. So I'm just giving for reference. It says, and he who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord. He will repay back what he has given. Okay, we don't demand it. But let me tell you, there is a day of repayment. Amen. We don't demand it. I don't want to give and say, Lord, now that I've given this man, please pay me back now. No, no, no. I'll show you how the Lord pays. But when you are giving to the poor, actually you are crediting heaven. And you are making God a, a creditor. You are becoming a creditor of God. You are telling God, look, you must pay me. Because the Bible says God will always, he must pay back. Let's move on. Another scripture to help us understand this. Luke chapter 14, verse 12 to verse 14. Quickly. Luke 14, 12 to 14. I want to see if I can finish this. For 12 to 14. Are you there? He says, then he also said to him, who invited him? This is Jesus has been invited by some fellow in his home. And they've had a good meal. Then he's asking questions. Jesus is answering. So the Lord tells this fellow, when you give a dinner, I know this is Christmas. How many have a plan for Christmas? Come on. All of you have no plan. Can I see how many have a plan for Christmas? Even if it's going, with Shago is a plan for now. Yeah. And I know when you are going with, in that plan, there are people you are thinking about. Am I right? Whom are you thinking about in that plan? Can somebody shout, whom are you thinking about? Your mom and your dad, isn't it? And others? Huh? Who? Siblings, your children. Others? Friends. Another one? Relatives. And others? Neighbors. Can I show you a scripture that can help you to have treasure in heaven? Lift up your hand and say, Lord, I believe the Bible. I know this Christmas some will get a little bonus. Some will get a little gift from your boss. Others will remember the increments they have had over the year. But this is what Jesus told this man after he had had a good time with him. And he says, look, when you have a dinner or a supper, help me here. Do not ask who. Help, help me. Who? Your friends and who else? 
your brothers and who else? Your relatives and who else? <laughs> are they not the people you are thinking? Because I know after this, you are going to have a budget. When your arrival shall go, your relatives will come. Your neighbors will come. Your friends will come. And the people that you think are very important to you are the people that you'll be thinking about. You know, the kingdom thing is a paradigm shift. Yeah. When you are going up in the kingdom, you go down. When you're supposed to go north in the kingdom, you go where? South. That's how the kingdom, the kingdom principles apply. So he speaks, he says, can we continue there? Not your rich neighbors. Then he tells them the reason why. He says lest. The word lest there means lest they do what? They also invite you and you are what? So whenever you do that, you are actually investing in them to repay you back. I know you're looking at me. That's a bishop why demolishing my plans for this weekend. I have no issues about that. As long as you take that corner, you remember the corner we spoke about? If you give the corner away, I have no issues. You go and stay with your neighbors and eat cuckoo with them. For those who come from where I come from. Or, or Mbuzi, where, those who come from the other sides. As long as you've remembered the poor, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you forget the poor, then we invite those fellows. I know a lot of Mbuzis will die. A lot of cuckoos are on stake. As I speak, you have already invited them to do what? To pay you back. But look at what Jesus is telling his disciples now. Are you a disciple? If you are, lift your hand and say, I am one. All right. He says this, but when you give a feast, can someone say hallelujah? hallelujah. Invite who? Help me here. Uh -uh, shout it out. The who? The poor and who? They may, and who? And who? Are those people, you are, are they the ones you are thinking about? Oh, now, eat that message first. Swallow it. Because I told you this is not any easy. It might not be very practical, but that is the truth. That is the truth. He says, invite the poor, invite the blind, invite the maimed, invite the lame. Then if you go to verse 14, he says, and you will be what? Help me. Yes. Aren't we looking for blessings? Uh-uh. Yes. Aren't we looking for blessings? Yes. He says, you will be blessed because, can you help me here? Because of what? They cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid when? Uh, I've not heard you when. Okay, some of you don't know, this life is not ending here. That's the reason why you have, but you still want. You know, there are people in this world, Kenya, who are living as though they are living in a different world. I'm telling you the truth. Most, some of you, 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 you've just been in pipeline. You don't know. I'm telling you there are homes on the other side. Listen. I'm telling you. When, when the gate opens, nobody even opens the gate for you. Actually, when you arrive there, they see you before you arrive. There's somebody sitting somewhere seeing you. And he has already been told Pastor Mlema will be arriving. So the moment you arrive and they see you, the gate just opens itself. It, it, it has got a sense. This time they don't press anything. The, the sensor just senses you, it smells you, and then it opens. <laughs> and the moment you look inside that, that compound, you begin organizing yourself where you will walk and where you're going to be. Me, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. The first time I saw a toilet that you sit on, because I was raised in Jerusalem, and our toilets were the ones which is a hole down there. Then my mama had a friend living in Lower Kabete. The husband was working for Kenya Power and Lightning. She had a director there. She says, can you come and visit our home? I went, we went to that. I was a young boy, class three. Went to that home and I couldn't believe the things I saw. <laughs> I went to the toilet. I wondered, what is this? I, when I told my mama, there is something here which I don't understand. <laughs> Even my mom had never seen it. I almost climbed on top to sit on it. <laughs> The ordinary things that we are seeing here today. Today we have some which you don't even do anything. You just go and do your thing. You leave and it flashes itself. It tells you bye. <laughs> but what am I saying? I'm saying don't live in this world as though you belong to this world. Because
because your season here is very limited. Can I tell you? Less than 100 years. And it's by grace you will reach 90. If you reach 70 or 80, you are favored. You didn't hear me. And then after that, that's where I want to bring that question of when you will be repaid. We are not going to be here forever. You people didn't hear me. You know, we don't preach the gospel of the resurrection and the gospel of ascension. We don't preach that. Today we are making people feel like the world belongs to them. Oh, gate and gate and gate. Gate, receive, receive. No! I'm telling you, when Jesus comes, if he comes now, to Nakwenda Mbinguni. And we'll be there for a very short time. How many know how long we'll be there? Seven years. I know some people don't know. Seven years in heaven. And the seven years are divided in two. Half of that period, the Lord will be rewarding us for the works that we have done. That's what he's mentioning here. You will be repaid at the resurrection. Not the resurrection of everybody. The resurrection of who? The just. That is what we call as rapture. The rapture. We'll sit with the Lord Jesus. And he will put crowns on us. Crown of righteousness. Crown of, uh, of giving. Crown of supporting the needy. Some of us will just enter. The way they entered, they will return the way they entered. These are the brethren who say, it's bored at me. But I don't want just bored at me. I want after I have preached so hard like this, after we've gone through the difficult times we've gone through, Lord, may you give me a crown. A crown. I see something that will be different. This is what he's talking about here. And after we have taken the crowns, we've been crowned, we'll sit on a table. It's called the, the Lamb's Table. We, we will have a hard communion here. This is reminding us what we'll do in heaven. The Lord will be at the high end of the table. And we'll have a feast for three and a half years. So if you don't eat good food, don't worry. You'll eat for three and a half years continuously. And as soon as we are done, the trumpet will sound. This is now the angels being dispatched. And we shall appear with him in glory. On earth, coming back on this earth. To be with him here for how long? 1,000. Where will you be that 1,000 years? Some people think that this world will end. No. When I see them build those good houses and put those good gates, I bless them. Because they are being preserved for what? To the end. You will see in the Bible. We are coming. Thank you, my brother. Nakuja. Are you listening to me? Okay, let me leave that. If I get excited, my time will disappear. So let's move away from that. You will be paid at the what? The resurrection. Okay? That is, uh, that is uh, Luke chapter 12 and verse, chapter 14 and verse 12 to 14. But look, at, look now at Luke chapter 12 and verse 34. Then I do the last one. I believe I have 10 minutes. I can finish the others in the next 10 minutes. Luke chapter 12 verse 34. Can we go there quickly? It says this. For where? Where your treasure is? Where your heart, your treasure is, is where your heart is. So if your treasure is here on earth, eh, you can know where somebody's heart is. You go to an ATM, you just see some people lining up. You, yes, I sit sometimes, I watch. The fellow goes there, and he doesn't ding, 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 ding. The thing comes out, he looks at it. If you see him just living, <laughs> you, you know there is something wrong. But another one looks at He just came to confirm where the heart is. <laughs> that is where your treasure is. Let's finish with this one. 19 Matthew 19 verse 20. 19 20. Matthew 19 20. It says this. The young man said to him. The young man said to him. This is the story of a rich young man. The one I've described. They are living in those green areas. This young man who has... Wonderful possessions, not treasure, possessions. On earth, they have possessions. Treasure is referred to only where? In heaven. So he says, the young man said to him, all these things I have, I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Now, this was the big question that many of us don't ask. He, had he went to Jesus. He told Jesus, listen, I want to know what must I do to see the kingdom of God. Jesus gave him the gospel that we preach. He says, love the Lord. He says, if you keep the commandments, you are okay. He says, if you love your neighbor, things will be fine. The young man says, he confessed, he says, can you help me? What did he say? All. Uh, 
all. Please go back. He said what? All. All these things I have kept from my... Was he wrong? Jesus knew. He would have told him you are wrong. Okay? But he went further. He says, what do I still lack? I'm simply telling you, move away from where you are. You didn't hear me. You see, we think we are okay because we are born again. Some, some of you are very happy because you give tithe. Ah, pastor, I remember you are poor. For, but I give my tithe. Let the church give out of that tithe to the, people, to the poor. The young man interrogated. He says, look, even tithe I give, but there's something which is, which I, is there anything else that I need to do? He wanted to be sure he's going to heaven. Look at the answer. And I stop. Jesus said to him, and I want you to read with me the whole, the whole passage of scripture. He says, if you want to be what? Can, can you repeat? You want to be what? Perfect. Perfect. I wonder how many of us here want to be perfect. There is a theology that says you can never be perfect. I refuse that theology. The Bible says God is perfect. And we can also strive to be perfect. So he also says if you want to be perfect, which I believe many of us would want to. He says go and help me here. to do And do what? Sell all what you have and give to the poor. And you will have what? Where? In heaven and come and do what? That wasn't a very good thing. That's the end of kill a kitu. Then I'm telling you, as you sell, it's not for nothing. All, all what you have sold and given to the poor, I'll keep it for you where? In heaven. Then after that, you just come and let's go to heaven. Follow each other. What do you think, how do you think the young man reacted? And that's how many of you will react when I'm done with this sermon. It's a hard one. Tell your friend it's not light. It's not easy. Yeah, it is, it's not easy. This is the way he answered. But, the, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had what? Great possessions. The young man could not eat or consume this message. So if you think you are very special that this young man, I can assure you, you will be tested. I think that finishes that point. I'll go to point number five, and this is the end. I have 10 minutes. I'm doing very well. I'm telling you, I feel so, I'm doing very well. <laughs> number five, consequences. Conse consequences of not doing what? Ministering to the needy and the poor. We've talked about the blessings. Now, if there are blessings of necessity, there are cons consequences also. And uh, this come for those who Two things. Simply oppress the poor or ignore the poor. I'm using two words. Oppress or ignore. Because for many of us, we may not oppress them. But we will ignore them. We simply ignore. This someone, you will ignore it after the service. It will just fed like any other. Because it's not of much importance to your welfare. The way you think. Okay? So you can ignore the poor. But there are others who know of course they know they're supposed to not oppress them, but they will go and oppress them to make more money or to save more money or to be happy with their egos. All right? Now, this reminds me, takes me to the New Testament. And I'll explain this in two minutes. The first man who died in the New Testament church, who knows him? What was his name? Some are saying Stephen... Who was the first man who died after the church began? Ananias. Ananias. Tell your friend Ananias. Now, people have different ways of looking at why Ananias died. But let me tell you, Ananias died for only one reason. He died for wanting, I put in my notes here, let me use my words here. He, as a result of abusing the ministry for the poor. Abusing. Abusing the ministry of the poor. Last Sunday, I established, when the early church started, people who had lands and houses, you remember the story? What did they do? They sold them and brought what? The proceeds to the apostles' feet, and they were given to those who are in need, such that the Bible says there was none among them that lacked. Do uh, you remember? Then, after a short while, a problem came. I mentioned to you, those, 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 those deacons who were appointed, when the problem came, were meant to do ministry to the needy. 
They were not meant to do administrative work in the church. They were meant to serve tables. Those people who were doing the ministry to the widows that were needed that particular time. Stephen, Philip, and those other men were not appointed to be deacons so that they can come to the altar and preach. Their job was to serve the needs of the people. But in the process, something happened. Acts chapter, let's go to Acts chapter 4. And look at verse 34 to verse 37. I'll just read through. Let the Lord help you to understand. It says, no, no, nor was there any among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands and houses sold them. And brought the proceeds of the things which they were sold. In verse 35 says, and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had what? Need. Let's go to verse 36. A man called Joseph. Can somebody say Joseph? This man also, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which translates son of encouragement. The name Barnabas wasn't really a name. It was just a nickname given to him because the man had a big heart. He was a man who, who was actually a man who encouraged others. So his name was, but because of his acts, the way he was behaving, the apostles called him who? Barnabas. Please understand that. A Levite of the country of Cyprus. Verse 37. It says, having land. Can somebody say having land? He didn't, that's what he had. He says, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. See, I've just preached a, very, a message here. And you are too happy with it and you've seen Najoli do it. So you also, Najoli has done it and everybody's seeing. Okay? So you are sitting there, Anania and Safira. You also say, even us, we want to show that we can also give. I said, the ministry to the poor requires your heart. Uh -uh. Are you listening to me? It requires what? And you must do it we willingly. It must come from your heart. From your heart. Chapter 5, now verse 1. Look with me. Chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man, when you see the Bible beginning with the word but, kunashida. And that's the problem with the church. When you hear the word, and that church was wonderful, but you will realize there's somebody who has issues. This man, Ananias, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. After selling that possession, in verse 2, verse 2, chapter 5, verse 2, verse 2, please, selling the possession, hanging there a little bit, Acts chapter 5, verse 2, all right, he kept back part of the possession, his wife also being aware of it, and brought certain parts and laid it at the feet of the apostles. The story you can read on your own. All right? So this man, he had made a commitment, I'm going to give my quarter. I'm going to give my small bit to the church to support the needy and the poor. Like many of us are, are, are thinking of doing here. The intention, the intent. But the moment the money came, what happens when the salary comes? Ask your friend what normally happens. When you look at the pay, pay slip and you see it is reading, it's reading 50,000 shillings and the school fees for your son next year, in King's International Academy, is 37,000. What do you do? What do you discuss with your husband and your wife? What do you say? Can you help me? Pastor, can you tell me? What do you say? We pay school fees first, and then next month we can, tr we can trust God. That's, that's the language. We even put God in the equation. Let's pay school fees first. Then next month, we can believe God to give us more money, and we can take it to the church. And your wife, because she's spiritual, she'll say, no, no, no. Just let us take half of it, the other half. That's what Safira said. So they agreed. Then they pick it and they bring. And they had made a commitment. The Bible tells me as soon as the, the, the Ananias appeared, Peter, full of the Holy Ghost, looked at Ananias and the, and the Lord says, Hey, you, you have violated the principle of giving to the poor. And they ask Ananias, Is this all that you, 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 you sold? And the man of God, without thinking, he says, Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Ura washanda makuta. Like some of us, we qualify with another tongue. And he says, Peter, yes, that's what the Lord gave us. Peter says, Ananias, do not lie to the Holy Ghost. And he gave an explanation. That's the explanation I want to give. I move away, I move away from this sentence. Look at the explanation in verse, verse 5. Is it verse 4 or verse 5? Verse 5. Okay? Verse, verse 5. He says, while, verse 4, sorry, why it remained. The word it there means what? The land. While the land remained. In other words, before you made a commitment. Now remember, listen to me. When you minister to the poor, you're not giving your tithe. 
Tithe doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. You give out of the abundance that is yours. While it is yours, it was not, was it not in your own, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own, in your own control? Look at that. In your own control. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Now, can you imagine, is you giving an offering to God? Why does God kill you? I've never put an answer to that until I read this. I realized God took this ministry very serious. He understood you are lending to him. And you cannot lend to God with lies. Especially when you are giving to the poor. You tell God, look, I'm going to give to the poor. I'm giving you 50 shillings. Then you take 20 and you tell God, uh -uh, I'm giving you only 20. The other 20 is mine. That's what this scripture talks about. And immediately Ananias fell down and died. I don't know where the wife was. Please come with your husband to church most times. <laughs> because you can arrive when he's not there. Sister arrives after the, after the boys have already gone to Langata. They've already buried the man in the back. Can you imagine how long did it take her to come really? How can they go and bury and come back? And the sister has not arrived. When she's arriving, who, uh, praise the Lord. Taka, 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 taka. She's arriving in her high heels. And Peter is looking. Peter stand, hey, you come, come on. He says, sister, this thing Ananias brought us here, was it the same thing that you had purposed in your heart? And they said, praise the Lord. God is so good, he has really blessed us. You know the, the way you want to impress people? Never impress anybody. Listen to me. When you give, don't impress anybody. This is why I, I don't... Me, since we began our church, there's no politician who has stood here. No. I can tell you, they're here. There is no man who has come here to say, oh, you know, I am, I am the MC of this place and I'm going to contribute so many Mabatis to this church. Never. Because we know God is the giver of all things. He's the giver of all things. But today we want to impress people. You come here, you say, I'm giving 10 million. All right? You think it's coming from the heart? What is the motive behind it? To make you vote for them. We need the spirit of God that was in the early church. We need to see people falling here. Una, una kuja unanguka. Tuna kubeba, tuna kupeleka langata. Madam Akifika, tuna muongeza. If that happened in the church today, people will be very serious. Are you listening to me? Can I leave that point? So you've understood what I'm saying. That statement simply says, it is yours until you purpose. God has no claim on it until you do what? You purpose. I can never give an order and you obey an order for the sake of obeying the order. This is why Paul says, every man as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. Can I speak to you this afternoon? That you purpose to, to get your blessing by giving. Amen. You didn't hear me? Amen. That's number one. All right? This ministry to the poor, oh my, my, my time is up. I said I'm very good, but um, can, I, can I take five minutes? Is it okay with you? Five minutes only. All right. Two things happen. Two things that help us to claim to bring judgment upon ourselves. Two things that bring judgment upon ourselves. Because the consequences is you bring judgment upon yourself. By that example for Anania, this man brought judgment on himself. He knew what to do. He did it the wrong way. And you can easily bring judgment upon yourself by either doing two things. The first thing, and you can write down, I won't read a lot of this, is found, is actually in acting or practicing or enforcing laws that are, do not favor the poor. When you do anything that does not favor a poor man, when you do anything that does not favor that poor fellow that is with you, or that widow, that orphan, that stranger that is with you, when you do that, you evoke judgment upon yourself. Have you heard me? Have you heard me? Isaiah 10, 1 to 3. It says this. Isaiah 10, 1 to 3. Woe unto those who enact evil statutes. And to those who continually record unjust decisions. So as to deprive the needy of justice. And rob the poor of, their, of, of my people of their rights. 
Now what will you do in the day of judgment? That's the question. What will you do on the day of the resurrection? The Bible is asking here. And the, the, the devastation which will come from afar. So don't, don't ever imagine on the resurrection day we'll be happy. Some people will not be happy. Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 42 says, Behold, he, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters, you know, this one let me explain. Maybe this one only then I'm done. Sodom was not destroyed of what, because of what you think. When we think of Sodom, what do we always think? And Gomorrah, what do we always think? Please help me. What do you always think? Immorality. Immorality. Men and women along Koinange Street and doing all those types of things. That's what comes into our mind. But let me tell you, it was not because of that alone. By the way, the reason the Bible gives for the destruction of Sodom was what is written there. And this is the prophet speaking. He says, behold, this was the iniquity. Iniquity means the sin of Sodom. The problem of Sodom, of thy sister Sodom. Then he mentions them. Can I mention one? The first one is what? Pride. Please read it out. Is what? Pride. Pride. Second? And then number three? Pride. Was in her and her daughters. Three things. Number one, pride. When God blesses you, what happens? What happens? There are people in this church who have been blessed. But the moment they got money, the rest of us became useless. Some were giving testimonies here how they have been blessed. But even calling them, and even when they see my call phone, they switch off. Because the pride comes in, pastor, I'm too busy. I have a lot of assignments to do. I'm, I'm going to this country and the other country. And immediately, pride comes in. Number two, fullness of what? Bread. Where we have a lot to eat. Chakule nakuwa nyingi sana. Especially during this season. And then most, the worst of it all, abundance of what? Idleness. Like I told you, go to the other side and the other side is this way. People are so idle. Money is working for them. You know when you're not working anymore, money is working for you. You have all the time for idleness. That's when you can go for a spa. Is it spa or what? Where somebody just ma... And then you're Russian, isn't it? And you're just sleeping. That's when you have all the time. Instead of being in the service, after this service, you are out there on the other side dancing because there's idleness of time. I said in the first service, car carnival, abundance of what? Bread. You eat until you turn. Your flag. You know? That is what Sodom was. It was the most affluent country. Affluent city. People don't know that. Sodom was like the, one of the cities where everything is there. And because people were very idle, they were full of pride, they were full of bread, they did something. The Bible speaks about it there. It says, neither, please help me here, neither, read it, neither, did she do what? strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. And I tell you something, the moment that thing comes in you, you will never remember the poor and the needy. Now go to verse 40, 50, verse 50. It says this, and they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. This man, that city burned because they neglected the poor and they need. And affluence is one of the things that makes people forget where they have come from. May God help us. Believe me, each one of us here has a beginning. Has a beginning. And if you don't have one, it will come. It will come. Don't forget where you've come from. God constantly reminded Israel, you are once a stranger. Always he would remind them. So when you see a stranger, treat him nicely. He will tell them. He will tell Israel, remember, there was a time when you had no food. And he would, I gave you manna, free food in the wilderness. But today when you just jump that line of, you know, you begin to feel like everything is okay for, with you. You begin to imagine, why am I giving her or giving him? Let me finish. May God help us. Ezekiel. 
I finished this one. Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter, chapter 22, verse 29. I'll, I'll read this one, then I will leave. 22, 29. I'm almost done, church. Give me just two, uh, two minutes. I'm done. It says this. The people of the land have done what? The people of the land have used oppression, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and the needy. They wrongfully oppress who? The stranger. Let's move on. The stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap between me and on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. You know, today, some of you may think, ah, mlema, iyo ni kitungine ngumu. But if you look at the words of 29, let me tell you, even when you don't pay your housemaid, and she has worked, and you don't pay her, you have oppressed the poor. I didn't know that. She has simply broken a glass. You, you deduct. Am I talking to mothers here? Ukivunja glass. You know, the, we just don't have time to talk about these things. Let me tell you. In fact, the Bible even tell, tells us wages, you know wages, W-A-G-E-S, should be paid immediately the work is done. A wage is not a salary. A salary is given at the end of the assignment. But a wage is given on a daily basis. It means this. When you deploy somebody, unskilled labor, and they do a job for you, pay them for that day. That is only simple. They are depending on that money for their daily bread. And if you don't pay a person his wages on that day, the fellow goes home, the children sleep, they sleep hungry, and they cry. And who hears? So I want you to imagine how much sin you are. A sinner you are. Ask your friend, how do you treat them? I know he won't give you an answer. In fact, he'll say, pastor is now offending us. He doesn't know how bad that girl is and how bad that man is. But let me tell you, those are tests God is giving to you as a believer. How much can you bless those people? In fact, when they have served you for a year or two, do you give them a bonus? When they are living, even when they have offended you, do you even tell them, now take this with you? Some of you, you even begin, you even check their bags. I know, I know I'm preaching. Do you, do you love me? Will you hate me for this? <laughs> and if you had given them a pair of shoes, you, you, you take it. May the Lord help us. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, can somebody say finally? finally. And it's the, one, it's the final one, my friends, for, for, for sure. <laughs> this one, is you bring condemnation when you do nothing. Can somebody say nothing? nothing? In other words, when you just watch. After this service, some of you will just watch. You won't do anything. Pastor Mlema, it was a good sermon. Yeah, it was not too bad. At least he explained something. How did you like it? Those are the, our conversations. Ah, he made a lot of noise. He even took a lot of our time. He said he'll finish on time. He didn't finish. That's the only thing you can remember out, out of this sermon. He makes promises which he doesn't even fulfill. And he says he's a man of God. How can we trust him? This one you can read for your own. The story of Lazarus and the rich man. You remember that story? What sin did the rich man commit? The Bible doesn't say he did anything wrong. But the only sin he committed was this. When God gave him to use it for the others, he did nothing. That's the only sin. And that's where we started our sermon from, if you can remember four weeks ago. Where Jesus is asking, you enter heaven, and as you enter, you find the Lord there at the gate. And he says, you come, you come, where in the uku, where uku, where uku. Okay? And you are carrying your big Bible, with a big smile, following your pastor. The Lord says, this side. Ah, why this side? Then he says, you, thank you, you faithful servant of mine. Enter into the everlasting life. Because when I was hungry... You fed me. When I had you know, no clothes, you clothed me. When I was sick, you visited me. Then, ah, how? When did I do this? Then the Lord says, when you did it to one of my little ones, you are doing it for this treasure. Go and pick that treasure. Then you arrive, the elder of the church, with the Bible. Your job was only to come and find a chair, sit nicely done, a jolly. You just sit in. <laughs> when the service is over, you stand up. You go to the boardroom, there's some little charge there for you, you drink. 
Then somebody opens the, the door of the car for you. You sit in and you go. You have no idea what other people are going through here. When they have needs, they are speaking to each other outside there in, the, in, in, in the parking. And this fellow who was told welcome is the one who took them and gave them a mandazi. But you, you just ate a good meal, Najoli, and things were okay. And the Lord says, get into the other side. Because when I was, then, when did I, when were you? The Lord says, listen, because you never did it to one of my little ones, you never did it for me. For doing nothing. Can I adjure you? Do something. Don't do nothing. Do something. Why? Because of this. I told you that's the last one, isn't it? Because of this. You will be, number three, rewarding yourself for doing nothing. Rewarding yourself for doing nothing. And I can tell you, it is not good to be rich. It's the will of God for you to prosper. But it is not good. Because when you are rich, can I tell you something? And you do not know why you are rich. You, are, you have already received what? Your reward. I said in the first service, the will of God to give you riches, and that's why we pray for you here, is so that you can say, thank you, Lord, for giving me these riches. All this money you've given to me, thank you. You've given me an opportunity to take this money and give to this one who doesn't have. Are you getting me? The paradox we've been talking about. Lord, you've given me a lot of food so that I can share with this other person who does not have food. Then God begins to bless you because you know the purpose which is given you that. Now, if I leave my message hanging like that, I will not have done you a favor. Let me give you those scriptures. Then we stand up and we pray. That's, that was my last point. Luke chapter 6 and verse 24. 24. Luke 26. This is Jesus speaking. Luke 26, 24. You believe in Jesus? How many believe in Jesus here? Is he your savior? Yes. If he stood here and told you to do something, will you do it? Yes. Uh, can I hear if he, he told you something, will you do it? Yes. Lift up your hand and say, I will, I will do it. Come on, do you believe it? Yes. Tell your friend, ask him, will you do it? Yes. Like Mary told them, told them, whatever he tells you, do. Will you do it? Yes. Now let me tell you what he's telling you now. Can I tell you? Yes. Okay, he's saying this. Who unto you who are rich? For you have received what? Your consolation. Does that sound too good? Okay. Not too good. Mm, that's, 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 that, mm, too good. Doesn't sound too good. But this is Jesus saying, woe to you who are rich. Not that he doesn't want you to be rich. But he's saying, if you do not know how to use your riches, you have already received what? When somebody is massaging you and you're feeling very nice, you're receiving your reward. I, have you heard me? I'm not saying you don't go for that. If it is a pyrotechnical massage that, it, that, that helps you to be healthy, fine. But if it's just that one, where my muscle, I just feel like my, I want, just want some good hands to touch me. You're receiving your reward. You're already in heaven. All right? Yeah. When your fridge is full of food and you're just eating carelessly and throwing away, you're getting your reward. Now, James qualifies these words. James, the apostle. And he qualifies them in chapter 5, verse 1 to 6. Take your Bible. Let's read it as we close. Chapter one, chapter 5, verse 1 to 6. Can I read it? This is the last one. Tell your friend, I think I'm going to this time, isn't it? Okay. And I say, come now. Who? You reach. Do what? Weep and? For what? Your ambassadors that are? Yeah, because they're they not seeing them, but they're coming. So, God help me. David prayed, he says, don't make me rich. Neither make me poor. Just give me what? Enough. So that I may not do what? Get rich and forget you. Or I become poor and do what? And still. That's the principle every believer must apply. Lord, make me contented with what I have. Now he says here, look at verse 2. Quickly, friend Araka. Help me, your riches are what? Corrupted and your garments are what? Both eaten. Meaning even those clothes that you are putting on. I've been reading some, you know, internet here and there. You find a woman or a man is putting on a dress worth $100,000. 100, 
and he has shoes $20,000. Has a watch of $50,000. This man is moving with a whole house which you can buy in Kisaju. <laughs> can you imagine? If you assess him, no wonder some, some of them, they cut their fingers. Because they go with the finger to the ATM or to a place where they can put the finger and get the money. And we think we are okay. Listen, the Bible says your garments are what? Moth eaten. Then it keeps on in verse 3. Verse 3. And I'm finishing with, with just a little more. Your gold and silver are eroded and their corrosion will be what? A witness again on the day of judgment. Listen to me. He says against you and you will, and will eat your flesh like fire. You only hell. And he keeps saying you have heaped up treasure for what? In the last days. Indeed, your wages of your laborers who mowed your field, the house girls and the house boys, who did work for you, which you kept back by fraud. What, have, what is happening? Cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Can you go to the verse 5? You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter in the day of slaughter the last verse 6 I wanted to make sure you have condemned you have murdered the just he does not resist you that is where we end may God help us what have I spoken throughout this season I've simply told you there is an opportunity for you to have a treasure in heaven I'm simply telling you there are rewards for those who minister to the poor May God help GCI to be those that will learn this ministry, apply this ministry, and be sure of the kingdom of God. God bless you for listening to me in Jesus' name. Please, would you come?